grab your outline for today's message. It's in your worship guide. We are starting a brand new series called How to Make Your Mama Cry. And so the whole idea of this series is navigating some of the uh, areas of our life and, uh, and learning really how to mess it up. And today we're going to focus in on our spiritual lives. And I know that across this room here in Columbiana, you guys are all super spiritual. you got your lives together. Everything's perfect. Nobody's got any problems. And you got it all together. You do everything right. You are all individually God's favorite. I mean, every one of you. So instead of really talking about the things it does to build that up, we're going to talk about some things today, how we can, how we can bring that down, how we can sabotage our spiritual lives. So I'm going to talk to you a little tongue-in-cheek today. And here's my hope is that God would stretch us and really bring us to a moment of uh, inventory in our life. Sometimes we need to walk in here and we need to know, okay, God, I feel you. I know I need to make a few changes there. And so that's what I hope God does in our life today. And so we're talking about how to make your mama cry. Do what would disappoint your mama. How many have ever made your mama cry before? You felt bad about it. You did something. You lied. You stole. You cheated. You snuck out of the house. Come on. You did something mama's not so happy with. And I can think about my own mom. I started thinking about this thought when we uh, titled this series. And uh, my mom was kind of different. I didn't get in trouble for things that as bad that mattered. Like if I brought home a bad grade or if I did something wrong, I didn't get as in big a trouble for those things as I did when I made a mess at my house. When I spilt something or I got a stain somewhere. I mean, you may not understand this, but my mom cleaned the cleaning products, okay? She was Danny Tanner on Full House. That's a true story. Every Monday, she cleaned the walls, the baseboards, under furniture furniture, move the furniture. It was an every Monday thing. This is a true story that when they decided to take the carpet out of our home and they put down hardwoods, there were areas of the carpet that were still as new and fluffy, unworn as, as when it was put in day one. The areas that we were allowed to walk, notice what I'm saying? Allowed to walk was worn to the floor. There were no more padding. Everything else, super fluffy. She would like vacuum the floor and for me to get to the couch, was like mission impossible, like lowering myself from the ceiling. You'd walk in there and I'd put a footprint. She would say, I just vacuumed the floor. Well, Mom, how am I supposed to get to the couch? You don't. I just vacuumed the floor. True story. That's just the way that it worked in my house. And so thinking back, the ways that I disappointed my mom the worst was when I made a mess. When I was about 10 years old, I opened up a bottle of ketchup for dinner, and I was really struggling. I, you know, I wasn't quite the, uh, the mass that I am now, so I was struggling a little bit at 10, and I thought, if I get just a little extra pressure and a little leverage on this lid, I can get this ketchup, this ketchup cap open. So I did what anyone would do. Is I took the bottle, and I placed it between my legs so I could get a little pressure on the bottle, and I began to pull on the top. And when I pulled the top, church, I don't know what happened in that moment. My life was over in front of my face. Ketchup literally went all over the place. It was on the ceiling. It was on the counters. It was on the floor. It was on the curtains that were in the kitchen. And before I knew it, my mom had leapt to her feet, came at me, and slapped my jaws right across the face. She would be mortified if she knew I was telling you this today. I mean, I didn't get beat. I just want to tell you, I just want to preface. I didn't get beat as a kid or anything like that. This was like abnormal. And I think I went to my room without food. Like I think I was sent away, like not to be seen for hours. And then I'll never forget, she comes to get me and she's, I need you to come and I need to talk to you. And she's bawling. I mean, she is just bawling. And she is apologizing for what she had done and the way she had reacted. And today, Day, when I tell stories about that, she just goes, I don't know what was wrong with me. I was just, a, she said, I'm so glad I'm a different person today. And I'm thinking, yeah, well, thank you for waiting 50 years. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> thank you for getting that together. But the disappointment of, of knowing myself that I disappoint someone else. You know what that feeling is to know that you let somebody down or that you didn't meet the standard that you hope to meet for somebody. And sometimes in our own spiritual walk, it's really easy if we're all honest in this room that we kind of get in a routine, we do what we do, and, and we know the things of God and we, and we show up. And we look like we're doing the right stuff, and we kind of talk the right way. But internally, maybe our spiritual life just isn't as healthy as what we would hope it to be and what God would ultimately desire for our life. So today, I want to walk through a few things just to sabotage that spiritual life. If we think we've got it together, here's some ways that we can destroy what God's doing in our life. And hopefully through the process of a tongue-in-cheek message, God would really encourage us and strengthen us back to some things that matter in our lives. So I want to pray and just say, God, speak to us through your word today. So Father, we love you. 
We're honored to be in this place. I thank you for all of my friends watching by the internet today. And I just pray that in this moment that you would speak to us, God, you'd encourage us. Lord, that you would just realign our lives and our hearts, show us what's important and what matters the most today. We come to receive from you in Jesus' name. Amen. So number one on your outline, here's how to, here's how to start spiritual sabotage in your life. You neglect it. Write that down. Your spiritual life, you just neglect it. Stop spending so much time with the Lord. Stop putting so much focus on your spiritual life. If you think you got it all, just neglect it. Here's what the Bible says. It says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So the Bible would tell us that you know if we put God first and we seek the things of God first, then everything else would take care of itself. But I would say if we really want to sabotage this thing, let's do it on our own. Let's go ahead and get our own plans together. I'm real guilty of this, of when I see something that needs to be done or something that's missing in my life or somebody I'm praying for, like I get that napkin out and I start writing down plans and ideas and I'm like, God, this is good. Hey, God, come over and check this out. Like, peek over my shoulder. If you would just do this, God, this is going to be awesome. And so it's like God's stubborn sometimes. I'm praying for him that he's not so stubborn because sometimes he didn't jump into my plans the way I think he should jump into my plans. But the reality is that the Bible says if I'm going to live in alignment, I need to be seeking the Lord above everything else, and then everything else will take care of itself. And I just want to be transparent with you today, and I'm your pastor, so give me a little grace. But I find myself learning this lesson over and over and over. No matter how long I live for Jesus, and no matter how many miracles I've seen God perform in my life and lives of people around me, I have a hard time always just knowing that if I just trust God, everything's going to take care of itself. And so I ask you this question today, what are you seeking first in your life? Just be real gut honest with yourself sitting in the room. We won't go around and tell stories, so you don't have to say anything. But if you ask yourself this question, what is the most important thing that I'm placing first that is seeked above everything else? The, the, the definition of seek is actually this. It means to crave or to pursue something. It means to crave or pursue. It means that there's something inside of you that motivates you to do what you do. I mean, if you're going to get up and go to work tomorrow to a place that some of you don't like, uh, doing something that you may not like to do, and if we're really honest, with people that you don't like to do it with. But something motivates you every day pretty consistently to go and to do it and to spend time and hours. And the motivation for most is at the end of that 40, 50 hour week is that there's some green that's going to come your way. That's the motivation to get it and to do it all over again. And so our spiritual life and the way that we live should be to seek him, to crave him, to pursue the Lord. That's what God would have us to do when he says pursue us. The problem is many of us will go to the Lord when our lives are a mess. That's how a lot of us get to Jesus. And there's nothing wrong with that. He wants to welcome us with our mess. The danger is that when the process goes like this, we go to Jesus when we don't have anything else. We've said we've done it all. We've, we've exhausted our resources. I can't do it anymore. So if Jesus is the answer, then Jesus, take the wheel, right? So we go to Jesus, and then we find out that everything we heard is really true, that Jesus really is who he says he is. He can do the things he says he can do. And suddenly my life gains a benefit from him. And then the danger comes is that when I begin to seek the benefit more than I begin to seek him. And so when I pursue him or when I seek him, I'm seeking the benefits from him, but I don't really want relationship with him. That becomes a danger. Our lives have to be aligned in such a way that I seek him more than I seek the stuff. In other words, he has to become more important to me than anything else. It's no different than many of our relationships in here. Some of you are sitting with a spouse or someone that you hope to one day be your spouse or some of you have your eye on someone that you think maybe could be and they say no today. Ladies, I don't know why you make guys chase you so long. Just give up quicker, okay? I can't tell you the number of stories, ladies, like he chased me for two years and I finally gave up. Well, stop. Just go, go for six months. Like, it's cool. Like, if it's going to happen, like, help a brother out, right? But there's some things that we did to pursue or to seek that person that we had our eye on. And I'll give you a few things, and I think this is, this is good with Jesus. I think it'll help us here if you want to write these down. And you'll know this is true. We found out, first of all, what pleases them. 
Found out what pleases them. Some of you sat up late watching some, uh, some, some football competitions yesterday. Uh, I don't know anything about sports, so I just know it's a football competition. You know, some, some Roll Eagle, War Tide, that type of thing, right? Uh, and some of you, as that, you know, uh, that pig of skin went down that green meadow and, and your hopes and dreams came true yesterday, hopefully every team hit a home run yesterday. That's all I got to say. Hope everybody had a good day yesterday. Some of you men are all about that stuff. I just lost my man card with some of you, so I can't even listen to you talk about Jesus now. You know, like football, like what's wrong with you? But some of you ladies, you, you don't either. And so until, until he started pursuing you, and then you thought, well, this is not so bad. And then you started like, well, roll tide. Can we watch the roll tide today? Can we do that? And then suddenly you went from talking like that and you really got the good old boy talk. You know how you really got to say roll tide, you know, <laughs> like guys, you showed up and she said, well, roll tide, baby, roll tide. And you thought, what has happened here? I love you. Like I love you. Guys, wouldn't it be good if there was just a manual? Like if you didn't have to learn it, like if we just had something that said, this is what I like. And this is what will get me to say yes to you. And, you know, I think the same thing about Jesus. We, t- we try to make it complicated. We go to church sometimes, and in the church world, we try to overcomplicate this thing with God so much. When God just saying, I just want you. And I gave you a whole book that is a road map that tells you what I love. You don't even have to guess it. You just have to know it. It's called the Bible. And if we want to get to know God, if we pursue Him, to get relationship with Him, and to know what pleases Him, we just got to get in the Word. And I know, I know it's hard, and I know sometimes it's, that, it's just the habit of getting into it, of understanding it, but I think the Bible's fun. Like, the Bible gets a bad rap about being boring, but it's not. It is full of all kind of... I, just, I, just, I like humor. So I'm going to tell you some things I see in the Bible that I like. Fellas, you will appreciate this. Um, it is better to live alone in the desert... Then with a crabby, complaining wife. And the men said, amen. Some of you were scared. I noticed you didn't say a word. I know. So this is what I want you to say. So some of you this week is going to, sweetheart, as the, uh, as the spiritual leader of our home, I feel like I need to share something with you in this moment. Uh, I had rather live in a desert than with a crabby, <laughs> complaining wife. But be real careful. Do not mention my name. It's just the Bible. I am the messenger. I am not the author. But I will tell you, fellas, be careful because you may end up living in that desert that you asked for. Wives, this is good for you. Look at your husband and say, uh, this is a husband that understood this. My breath is offensive to my wife. Ladies, just carry that mint with you right there. Say, yeah, you and your breath stinks, okay? I think that's funny. This is what's great. Some of you think church is boring, that type of thing. But notice what happened in the New Testament. The Bible says, as Paul spoke on and on, a young man sitting on the windowsill became very drowsy. Finally, he fell sound asleep and dropped three stories to his death, okay? You thought you attended a boring church. Even in the, in the Bible, there was people falling asleep, falling out of windows to their death. Like, hey, how was, how was church today? How was the message? Well, I killed a guy. It was really, really bad. Like, I thought I've had some low days. I hadn't killed anybody yet, so thank, thank God. Find out what it takes to pursue the Lord. Read your Bible. We like to spend time with that person. Just spend time with them. Listen, if people that you love, that you're pursuing, you need to give them your time. Do this with the Lord, with prayer. Talk to Him. Spend time with Him. You can't build a relationship if there's not communication. Spend money on them. Come on, guys. You spent money you didn't have when you were pursuing her in the beginning. Like, you made stuff up. Like, you actually went and bought shoes that didn't have holes in them, shirts that you had to tuck in. Like, you really put it together. You did things that you wouldn't ordinarily do. And so give to God. Give Him. Be generous with Him. Treat them special. Come on, the Lord likes to be worshipped. That's why we come in here and we sing songs. We don't do this for a show or something to do. We come in because we say, God, we, we honor you. We love you. You're the guest of honor in this place. And before we do anything else in this moment to ask from you, to receive from you, to get your word, to align our hearts, we're going to come in and we're going to honor you. We're going to worship you. We're going to give to you first. Treat them special. Some of us in our relationships may need to go back and do that again. Treat them special. Open the door for them a little bit. And, and when they ask you, do these pants make me look fat? You do something spiritual and you lie and say no. Even if it's a lie, you say no. Because that's what we do, right? You treat them special. Come on, you do things that you wouldn't ordinarily do and then brag on them. 
Nothing makes somebody feel more special than when you walk into a room and you say, hey, I want, there's somebody I want you to meet. Let me tell you all about them. Let me tell you how much I love them, how awesome they are, and who they are, and what they do. And suddenly you feel like the most important person in the room. God has done some incredible things for some of us in this room, and God's like, Hey, you're going to mention it? You're going to tell them what I did? You're going to let somebody know? Or you want to you make me proud? And we're like, nah, that's cool. I appreciate it, but I'm not going to even mention it to anybody. God's disappointed. God likes to be bragged on. Share what God has done in your life. These are just things, just ways that you can connect to God and you can bring your relationship and make it stronger if you pursue the Lord and seek Him first. That's just if... We need to keep our relationship fresh. But if we're not worried about that, if we just want to do it our own way, then we just do what we can easily do and just neglect it. Or number two, here's how we can sabotage our spiritual life. We can reject it. Just reject it altogether. And I don't mean by saying, well, I don't believe in God, or I reject the Word, or I reject that God's there. Some people take that approach. But I would say every one of us in this room, to a degree in our life, has found ourselves in rejection of who God is. And I'll prove it to you. Jesus said... Anyone who loves me, and most of us would probably say, yeah, I love Jesus, I love the Lord. But Jesus says, if you love me, well, then you will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. So Jesus said, it's not based on emotion, it's not based on feeling, it's not based on a moment of that tingly sensation I got, but it's based on if I really love the Lord, then it means that I'm obeying Him. If I am accepting Him and I am walking out an authentic Christian faith, it means that I'm walking in obedience to the Lord and what He says. It's not cookie crumb Christianity. That's the way I think about it sometimes. Many of you are guilty of this. Do not raise your hand because you don't want anybody to know. But it was like Friday night. You know, you were tired, been a long week, been a bad day. And you just want to sit on the couch in your sweatpants with the holes in it and watch something on Netflix. And you found yourself with a brand new pack of cookies that was bought for the family. And the next thing that you know, when the movie is going off, you look down and there's nothing but crumbs in the cookie container but one cookie. And you think to yourself, I, sh- I shouldn't eat that last cookie. I want that last cookie. I shouldn't eat it. No, I'm not going to eat it. And you wrap it up and you put it back in the cabinet. For somebody else in the family to go, hey, we still got some cookies? And you say, yeah, they're in the cabinet. And they go to open up that pack and there's one cookie left in the box. And they say, did you eat all the cookies? And by technicality, you say, No, there's still cookies in the pack. By technicality, you are correct, but there were 51 cookies and you ate 50. Let's just go ahead and say you ate the whole pack. But many of us live that type of Christian life. We live by technicality. Yeah, I go to church. Yeah, I know John 3.16. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I got the t-shirt. Yeah, I know this. But the technicality is only a technicality. It doesn't mean it's the whole truth. And so if I don't live out my life walking in obedience, exactly the opposite thing is happening. I am rejecting what Jesus said is the number one sign as if I love him. It's that I obey him. And I'll tell you this, partial obedience is still disobedience. Partial obedience is still disobedience. Son, go pick up your toys. If there are still toys there and he picks up some, he did not pick up all of his toys and fulfill what I said to do. It, that partial obedience was still disobedience. Delayed obedience is still disobedience. In other words, son, pick up your toys. That does not mean an hour later he can stroll through and do it when he decides he wants to do it. If he delayed doing what I said to do when I said to do it, he still disobeyed. And many of us are walking around with delayed obedience and partial obedience. And Jesus is going, at the end of the day, you're still neglecting and you're rejecting. You're not doing what I said to do. How do we know? Let's look at some things very simple Jesus said to do. Jesus said, hey, be baptized. Come on, have you you haven't been baptized, you need to be baptized. I mean, I, I get it. 
I know some of you are afraid of water. You think we're going to let the bubble stop. Okay, we won't. Nobody's died yet. Okay, nobody has. I promise you won't be the first. Some of you are afraid you're going to mess your hair up. Come on, let's be honest. Your hair don't look that good when you walked in here fresh. Okay, let's just be. Uh, I know I'm hurting some feelings. I mean, look at mine. I mean, what am I going to mess up? You know what I'm saying? Like what? So don't worry about that. You don't want your makeup to run. We just don't wear it in here. Then it won't run anywhere. Okay, you can do your makeup after. We always got these things that we get we get concerned about. I don't want anybody to stare at me. But the Bible says. Immediately, when people were saved, they started running to the water. They wanted to be baptized. Jesus said to do it. It's an act of obedience. Jesus told us to share. He told us to serve. He told us to give. We are to conform to him. We are not to have him conform to us. I know this is tough. I'm talking to me too, so don't look at me like I'm hurting your feelings. I'm talking to me too. Just the Bible says, look, if we want to do it our own way, and we want to do a landslide in our faith, well, then we can just reject the things that Jesus says. But if we want to grow, and we want to be closer, and we want to make movement to be who Jesus has called us to be, and to do what Jesus has called us to do, then we will begin to embrace the things Jesus said to do. And then number three, the last thing i tell you, and this is a good one, if you just want to let your, your spiritual life go downhill, just fake it. Fake it. And man, we are good at this one. The Lord says, these people say they are mine. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And their worship of me is nothing but man-made rules learned by rote. In other words, it's just a system of things that we've learned because it's just we do what we do. Sometimes we get, we get real caught up in church over things that we do, and we think that's the only way to do what we do. And the reality is, all we're, all we're called to do is worship the Lord and reach people. And to live out what the Bible says for us to do. This systematic living of Christianity in the South, especially for us, is dangerous. Because we learn what it means to just fake it until we make it. We've got this this Bible Belt Christianity. In other words, I thought about it this way. Culturally, in the South, everybody's a Christian. Everybody. I don't care who you meet, talk to. They would mostly say, yeah, I'm a Christian. I've heard people say, well, I love God, but I hate the church. I mean, I love God. I'm cool with God, but I don't want anything to do with the church. And I understand it's because of hurt, some things that people have walked through. But let me tell you, we are the bride of Christ. We are what Jesus gave his life for. It is what the early disciples and the apostles, it's what they gave their lives to build was the local church. And the local church is the hope of the world. And you can't separate the two. If I've got the heart of God, I've got the heart for God's people. And I've got the heart to be involved in the things that are reaching people for him. We can do more together than we could ever do on our own. So it's a heart issue. We've got Eastmas Christians. Easter and Christmas, when you know some of those? Come on. Wouldn't that be awesome? I mean, kind of, if it just worked that way, you're like, oh, it's Easter. Oh, yeah, I can do that. New outfit, get it together, go hang out with everybody, an awesome lunch after. That's an incredible Sunday. Christmas, yeah, we'll sing some songs, light some candles. I love Christmas. The rest of the time, ah, you can have it. I'm good. I love Jesus from the house, right? The reality is, you just, you're not going to grow. You're not going to grow like you're going to grow in community. And so we get this where we say, you know what, I'll just do it my way and this is good enough. We bless God on the outside, but it is, oh, God on the inside. We just learn to fake it till we make it. I do that every football season. Come on, you guys start talking about football. I'm like, yeah, man, roll tide, roll tide, roll tide. You know, the tide won yesterday, 50-something to like two. I looked it up. You know how I know? Siri told me. I said, hey, Siri, what's the, what's the score? So I don't look like a complete idiot when you come rolling in talking about football. Some of you ladies started doing that. You know, you started doing that with football season. Now you tell your husband, you say, roll tide, baby, roll tide. You know, you got the whole accent and everything. So we fake it until we make it. We try to make it happen. Why? So that we can fit in. Don't tell anybody you're struggling. Don't tell anybody there's a problem. You just say, bless God and praise the Lord. And I love you, brother and sister. And this is the day that the Lord has made. And on the inside, we are just struggling and we are falling apart. And we are we're just this close to saying, never again. I just give up. And God's saying, look, if you just be honest with yourself, we all have those days. And we all have those seasons. And we all have those moments that we need God to be God. And we need him to show up in our life. Stop trying to fake it. Because in God's economy, listen, when you fake it, you will never make it. There's not one person going to be standing in heaven going, I'm so glad I faked it all those years. I don't tell them I'm here. You know what I'm saying? You guys ever seen that TV show, like The Good Place? I'm not supposed to be here. (laughs) Don't tell on me. 
That's not going to happen in eternity. But I can tell you this. Even on my worst day, when I've done everything wrong, God loves me more when I'm genuine. And I say, God, I didn't get it right. As a matter of fact, to take a little bit of the pressure off of your shoulders, here's what the Bible tells us. He said, I'd rather you be hot or cold than I had you be lukewarm. I talked to a pastor the other day from up north and asked him, I said, how are you settling into the south? He's been here for about 10, 15 years now. And he said, you know, I still struggle. He said, up north, when I would tell somebody about Jesus, they'd just give me the finger and tell me to leave them alone. I was like, really? He said, yeah. He said, but here in the south, everybody says, well, praise the Lord. I love God. And he's thinking, I know you don't. He said, but at least up north, I knew where I stood. At least I knew up front where you were. And that's all God wants from us is just genuine honesty to stop faking it. Man, we do so good. I love to get in a conversation with somebody, and we're talking about, they're talking about, you know, football. Praise God, yesterday we got a big roll tide and blah, 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 and bleep, 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 bleep. And then, you know, and then it goes on, and they're dropping all these words and stuff. And then they go, hey, what do you do for a living? And I'm like, um, well... I'm a dad. I'm a dad. I have a son. Yeah, but I mean, what do you do 40, 50 hours a week, you know? I said, well, I'm a pastor. Oh, well, pastor, bless God. I'm so glad to talk to you. I'm so sorry. I don't usually talk that way. I don't usually say things like that, but I've just been struggling with some things in my life, and I've been meaning to talk to somebody. I've been meaning to come to church, really. I've been thinking about it every Sunday. I've been thinking about coming down there to church, and uh, I was going to write that church a check, you know, because I know y'all doing good things when you need some money or something like that. Can I write you a check right now, pastor? Can I give this to you? And I'm like, hey, Keep your money. It's okay. You didn't want to come to church, and that's fine. Like, just why do we got to change all of a sudden? Can I tell you, God knows us from the inside out. And the best thing I could tell you today is you don't have to put on a show for God. You can just present Him where you are. And so if you want to stay where you are, and you never want to make a, uh, make a change, if you never want to get closer to Him, if you never want your life to improve spiritually, well, then just, just neglect it, just reject it, and just fake it. Because that's what the enemy would have for our life. But I'm here to tell you today, there's great news. Revelation 2, 4, and 5 on your outline. I'll end here. But this is what I have against you. This is what the Lord says. You do not love me now as you did at first. Think how far you've fallen. But here's the good news. Turn from your sins and do what you did at first. So I know that, man, we started strong. The relationship was hot. But over time, it seems to have dwindled just a little bit. But the Bible simply says, look, just go back to your first love. Do what you did at first. Begin to pursue me. Begin to seek me. Begin to obey me. And then just be honest with me. And I promise your life will grow spiritually. So here's what I want to do. I want us to bow our head, close our eyes. And if you're a guest today, nothing funny or weird is going to happen. Our band's going to come back up. They're going to play music softly. And I'm just going to pray for us. I'm going to pray for us in this room and all my friends who are watching by the internet. And I have two things on my heart today. And number one is this. Some of you walked in here or you're watching by the internet. And I know this to be true because this happens every single week. That you showed up for church for some reason. Either somebody invited you, begged you, bribed you. and That's awesome. Or you just felt this tug at your heart and your life that maybe there was some hope for your life. And maybe Jesus was that hope. And so sitting in this room, just taking some inventory, you've, you've gotten honest with yourself and realized that you don't have that personal relationship with Jesus. And today is your day that I want to pray for you, and I want to encourage you in that decision today. It's the greatest decision you could ever make in your life. I can't describe fully the goodness of God and who He is when you invite Him into your life. It's something you just have to experience. And I want to tell you this, that there's a church here that's committed to helping you. And so if you make that decision today, I want you to mark it on that connect card that Adam talked about earlier. There's a place that says, today I'm giving my heart and my life to Jesus. And if you'll mark that, we're not going to bother you, show up at your house or place your mailing list. But here's what we would do. Number one, we'd send you a letter in the mail this week. It tells you how to take some next steps. Just to say, hey, here's how you can begin to grow. Here's how you can walk in obedience to the Lord. And then we'll make ourselves available to you. If you need some help, somebody to walk it out with you, then we're here for you. And secondly, we'll be praying for you. I can promise you with every bit of confidence that there will be teams of people praying for you, specifically by name and the decision that you made this week. It would be our honor to pray that for you. 
And then maybe you're here and you're like me. You've been serving the Lord for some time. And sometimes we just need a moment to remind us of why we do what we do. And instead of getting in the routine, we just need to go back to our first love and do it the way we once did. Let the main thing be the main thing, and that's Jesus. And so I want to pray for all of us today that God would meet us where we are. He would strengthen us so that when we leave out of these doors, we leave more valuable for him than we did when we came in this room. So Jesus, I love you today, and I thank you for every person, all my friends in this room and watching by the Internet, and we pray right now for any person that would say today that they want to give their heart or their life to you. We confess we've got sin in our life. We know sin separates our relationship from you. And we just ask you to forgive us, to help us, to grow past those sins and those temptations in our life. And we know that you can. Thank you for loving me today. And thank you for your forgiveness. I put you first today, Jesus. I commit to learn what it means to love you and to live for you. And Father, for all of us today, I just pray, grip our hearts. Align our lives to you. Let us leave out of this place deciding that we will no longer neglect our relationship with you. We'll no longer reject the things that you've called us to do. And Father, we won't walk in a fake Christianity, but we'll bring ourselves and our issues and our hurts and our problems and all of our shortcomings. We'll just bring it to you because that's exactly the way you want us. And we thank you today that there's hope for our life. And we thank you today that you're moving inside of us and making us better. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church. Let's honor the Lord. Can we do that today? Come on, he's worthy of it. He deserves it.